Hi, one of the common questions we often get asked is about the approach to respiratory management. This will be a pragmatic approach on what we do in practice. So the main things is to follow the steps right from the delivery room and obviously the neonatal resuscitation program guidelines is ideally practiced so that everyone is in sync. The initial ventilation pressure is 20 to 25 centimeters water set the peep at 5 and it's obviously better to use the TP's device like Neopuff. The flow should be set at 10 liters. Don't adjust the flow unless you're not able to achieve the pressures because if you adjust the flow the set pressures will change. And uh, educate the team on the importance of keeping the flow constant once you set the pressures so that there is no confusion. And uh, as I mentioned a Neopuff is better than the self-inflating bag mainly because the peep is delivered and the pressure is controlled while in a self-inflating bag you have more flexibility with the pressure that you need but at the same time you may be overdoing the pressure and the lack of peep is a big disadvantage when it comes to managing premature babies. CPAP in the delivery room can be safely applied and if the baby has a reasonable respiratory effort and is just having distress or difficulty oxygenation you start with CPAP and you can use the Neopuff uh, with a mask and you can switch to the nasal prongs that transfer. Try to use the transport ventilator with the nasal CPAP. I mean having the Neopuff during transfer means you open the incubator door which affects the temperature. It's difficult for the person walking along to be crouching with the mask as well and the seal may not be appropriate as moving. So try to use the nasal prongs, train your team on setting the transport ventilator and moving with the prongs. It's very important at this stage to remember that appropriate temperature care is important because if the baby gets cold, the surfactant utilization of is affected, the recycling of surfactant is affected, so baby might need more respiratory support. And this doesn't apply just to the premature babies, it applies to the larger babies as well who have respiratory distress. There are recent studies which look at more frequent use of the laryngeal mask airway, uh, both in the labor room scenarios as well as in the NICU if the baby needs IPPV during the course of management like in case of apnea. The efficacy of the laryngeal mask airway is better and there is more consistency than using a mask because the positioning of the mask may vary from person to person and if your concentration is changing it might go off. So if you expect to need a reasonable length of IPPV with a mask, it's better to consider laryngeal mask airway. Hopefully we'll have the smaller sized one so we can use it in babies less than 34 weeks as well. Currently. The size one is applicable for more than 34 weeks even though from personal experience many colleagues have said uh, around 1500 grams and above they are able to use it. So once the baby has respiratory distress and is admitted to the NICU how do we proceed with the further management? So we should remember that RDS is an evolving disease so the picture you see at any point in time is likely to change both depending on the progress of the condition and the intervention that you are doing. So continuous careful evaluation at every step and timely intervention are essential. There is good evidence to support that surfactant therapy given early is better than delayed surfactant and there is no evidence for prophylactic surfactant uh, even in the tiny baby. So if the baby needs intubation and has respiratory distress you obviously give surfactant otherwise you go with the criteria. The European consensus guidelines suggest the FAO2 of 0.3 and CPAP of at least 6 cm of water. So once you reach a CPAP of 6 cm and the baby has respiratory distress, you decide early to give surfactant and we will discuss next how to go about it. So the severity of RDS can only be determined clinically using a combination of the FAO2 which is a fraction of inspired oxygen that is needed to maintain normal saturation. This is coupled with a judgment of the work of breathing. Some babies are slightly tachypneic, they have grunting but they are not recessing much while uh, the smaller premature babies recess and the uh, Downs and Silverman score of respiratory distress you can refer my earlier videos on these could guide you on the assessment of severity of respiratory distress. It's uh, not essential to score it. Uh, the degree of aeration of the lungs on chest x-ray is important and the PCO2 on the blood gas, especially in the babies under 28 weeks, we are more worried about hypercapnia associated risk of IVH. 
So if you have arterial blood gas, it's well and good. If you have a capillary blood gas, remember that the CO2 is slightly higher on the capillary gases. You have to account for that. Uh, I've not mentioned lung ultrasound here because we are not routinely using it, though we are definitely in the process of training and starting to use it. So if you do have lung ultrasound, as you would see from uh, my video on Dr. Pradeep Suryavanshi's lecture on lung ultrasound and its role, it can be used fairly easily and if you want to introduce it in your unit, you can consider using it instead of the X-ray and you might be able to uh, score the severity on the lung ultrasound and decide on the need for surfactant based on that. So people and as well as studies are reporting that this may improve the progress. All these are variable and can be influenced by CPAP if adequate pressure is used. So once you review this, you apply the right level of CPAP, make sure the humidifier is on. Sometimes you notice that in the hurry bury the humidifier is left off and remember the baby is getting cold air with a high flow through the CPAP machine and that's not good for the lungs at all. Make sure the temperature of the baby is optimal, make sure we are not handling the baby too much and then leave the baby calm for a period of time, half an hour, one hour, observe the FIO2. If there is worsening, you decide on the next step. If the pressure on CPAP is not adequate, the increased work of breathing can itself cause metabolic acidosis. Uh, so prompt action after close evaluation is needed if the CPAP is not adequate. So normally we start with a CPAP of 5 to 6 centimeters. So in a baby with respiratory distress who is mildly distressed, you can use uh, closer to 5. But if there is significant recession, we can go straight to 6 centimeters of water. And as I mentioned, ensure the humidifier is on. There are three possibilities from this stage. The baby stays stable on CPAP, the respiratory distress improves, blood gas is improving and the oxygen stays below 0.3. In this case, just continue the CPAP and wean as possible according to what your unit practices. Some of us wean to high flow, some of us wean the CPAP pressure to 4 and then take off CPAP. If the baby has significant retractions, respiratory acidosis on the gas with or without an abnormal chest x-ray. So the x-ray may not be too abnormal in the beginning and it can take time to evolve. So the x-ray picture is not going to really guide you on this. Uh, we sometimes wait for the x-ray unless you have a worry of pneumothorax till you put the lines in. And uh, the oxygen requirement is more than 0.3 or approaching 0.3. Then you go for surfactant therapy. If the baby has increasing distress, the PCO2 is high on gas, but the FAO2 is below 0.3 and the effort is good, we could increase CPAP to 6 to 7 cm maximum. We avoid going to very high pressures on CPAP without surfactant in RDS. So remember that if it's a later stage of lung disease, uh, your post uh, the first surfactant deficiency stage in the first 3-4 days, it's a different scenario. But in the first 2-3 days when the disease is evolving, when surfactant deficiency is a primary cause, you want to replace the surfactant as far as you can. In uh, resource limited settings, you have to decide how you approach it because if surfactant is a valuable resource and you want to limit it to only the most essential cases, you could consider an IPPV, but that increases the risk of pneumothorax. And we recently did an audit in our unit and we have uh, decided not to use an IPPV. Uh, once you reach a CPAP of six to seven and uh, the baby is not maintaining, we go for surfactant first and then we go for NIPPV. So obviously the stiffer the lung, the higher the pressure you use, the higher the risk of uh, the tissue breaking and air leaks happening. So that is a basic reason this happens. So this is the European consensus guideline. Most of you would have seen it and it's available as a free resource online as well. I would recommend you to go through that. So. The basic steps can be the start preterm and term babies on CPAP 5 to 6, adjust the FIO2 to keep saturation close to 95. Our aim is to keep 90 to 95, but when I say keep closer to 95, it's to decide on what the actual FIO2 needed is because the baby may maintain 90% saturation uh, with the FIO2 of 28, 26%, uh, but when you actually need to bring it to 95, you start crossing 30%. So you are not delaying your decision making. We don't want more than 95%, of course, you don't want hyperoxia. So 90 to 95, aiming closer to 95% is a good idea not to delay your uh, diagnosis based on the FAO2 criteria. Uh, chest X-ray is a point assessment and uh, it's not a good guide to the need of surfactant. It would support surfactant therapy if there is moderate to severe RDS, but a picture of mild RDS with significant clinical signs or a rising FAO2 would still warrant surfactant therapy. So uh, most of us do the chest x-ray to go with 
the diagnosis for this uh, insurance purposes as well but to clinically decide you can do use a lung ultrasound if you have it better than an x-ray and also remember that the FiO2 is variable the same way we can quickly start uh, developing slight shunting uh, PPHN like scenario the FiO2 can rise so if there is respiratory distress even with the PPHN scenario if there is RDS like picture you can give surfactant so that might improve because it's all compound uh, I mean it's all uh, linked to each other so the lung disease causes hypoxia the hypoxia causes pulmonary vasoconstriction and the PPHN like setting starts uh, and this will worsen if the lung disease is not treated so you need to decide whether it is RDS or not uh, of course primary PPHN in a term baby is different scenario so uh, if you have uh, FAO2 slightly on the lower side not meeting the criteria but the baby has clinical findings suggesting RDS you can decide to give surfactant even if it's not meeting the FAO2 criteria so it's not one criteria alone it's the overall picture so the combined clinical judgment based on all the factors uh, if the mother didn't have antenatal steroids there is a risk of infection the baby needed resuscitation etc would add to the risk as well especially if there is acidosis uh, we mentioned that in these cases avoid NIPPV and if clinical concerns are there it's better to give surfactant by insurer or LISA before moving to NIPPV so uh, if the baby needs surfactant based on the above, the next decision is to go for LISA or we decide on whether the baby needs to stay ventilated for a brief period and this decision is also a complex decision uh, linking different factors in the case like if the baby didn't have antenatal steroids, if there is a sign of PPHN that the baby is uh, showing shunting or fluctuating, if there's a pre post difference or if the baby has hypotension or a sign of sepsis then you can prefer to keep the baby ventilated for a few hours before you remove the tube if everything else is okay it's just the RDS and the baby is otherwise stable you can do insure and uh, so uh, these are the settings where you would consider uh, keeping the tube in and uh, in the resource limited settings again uh, there are studies coming out on how to confirm the tube with the ATCO2 sensor even with non-invasive techniques like LISA uh, the insure technique it's more straightforward in terms of uh, making sure the tube is in the right place you're comfortable uh, intubating the baby with a smaller ET tube so you don't need to use a larger ET tube in these cases just the smallest possible you confirm the ET tube position uh, and then give the surfactant and remove the tube so in terms of pulmonary outcome I don't believe it will make a big difference whether you use insure or LISA of course, the LISA cat uh, enables you to continue the CPAP more easily than if you are intubating the baby. Uh, some people report using insure and keeping the CPAP on at the same time, which may be challenging. But of course, when you are intubating, keep the Neopuff and the mask CPAP handy so the minimum period without the CPAP. So by deciding on surfactant early and not avoiding an APP, not starting an APPV before using surfactant, we avoid masking babies with significant RDS and delay uh, delaying surfactant therapy and this also reduces the risk of air leaks we avoid exposing these immature babies to the high pressure and uh, once the surfactant is given the pressure requirements on NAPPV would reduce even if you subsequently go to NAPPV so the risk of spontaneous intestinal perforation might reduce as well I'm saying might because we don't know how much each of these factors contributes but of course when you are using an APPV with the ventilator there is a high PIP delivered and it might increase especially if the baby is at risk and uh, after the surfactant dose if the baby needs higher pressure uh, we consider an APPV if you have done insure if the baby received the first dose non-invasively a repeat dose is considered if there is persisting high oxygen or worsening distress on an APPV if you have the option otherwise you can go little higher on the CPAP pressure uh, if you don't have the option for an APPV and uh, at this time as well you would have a similar approach on deciding whether you want ventilation or just the less invasive technique for surfactant and extubate so you would have uh, I mean even a few hours on uh, ventilation shouldn't harm in terms of the BPD risk especially in the bigger baby so if you are worried keep the tube in rather than exposing the baby to two intubations but extubate the earliest possible so even two three hours is possible but uh, train your team to recognize these so that the less invasive techniques are used more we are using insure or lisa and uh, if in doubt you can keep the tube so don't 
criticize people for doing that as well so that uh, we don't expose the babies to unnecessary procedures so the supportive treatment is very important as well so focus on avoiding hypothermia introduce the ivh prevention bundle in babies under 30 weeks in the first few days i will make a video on that as well soon we should consider antibiotics to cover early onset infection and if the markers are negative and the culture is negative we stop by 36 hours in most of the cases uh, avoid using procalcitonin in the first two to three days as we know procalcitonin levels are fairly high in the first two to three days and you may over treat use crp after 12 to 24 hours because there is a lag period uh, you can do initial crp as a baseline and even if even if the first crp is high that does suggest infection but if it's an uh, increasing trend, it would confirm that. Uh, IV fluids, total parental nutrition and central line would depend on gestation, weight and unit policy. Uh, if you have EBM, start trophic feeds at the earliest possible, even in the babies with respiratory distress, whether they are on invasive or non-invasive ventilation. If the baby is progressing on feeds while on ventilation, we do progress to full feeds uh, even in babies on NIV and we prefer two hourly feeds to minimize the risk of reflex and better tolerance of the feeds and we reach full feeds faster this way. Uh, once the baby is off the respiratory support, you go to three hourly and start suck feeding. We don't offer suck feeds on babies on uh, non-invasive ventilation as well as far as possible. So uh, extubate at the earliest possible, except in the tiniest babies under 26 weeks, we prefer a few days ventilation and the smaller the baby, the longer the uh, duration of ventilation needed. Many 23-24 weeks often stay ventilated for 7 to 10 days. Then uh, you may extubate followed, I mean, following a dart if needed or if weaning well without the steroids. Uh, wean the NIPPV to CPAP once the baby is extubated and is tolerating. There is no rush in this process, especially if you are using a simple device like a RAM cannula, which is gentle for the baby for NIPPV. But remember that if you are using a RAM cannula, you need a higher pressure to compensate for the resistance in the circuit. So around 30% more pressure uh, than what you would use otherwise. Consider high flow nasal cannula if the baby is stable on CPAP. We use OptiFlow. There are units which use Vapotherm which works as well and there are ventilator delivered high flow nasal cannula as well. In babies less than 32 weeks, we consider maintaining high flow around 3 liters or as needed. Uh, till they reach over 1.25 so at least 3 liters per minute but if they need more obviously you give you can decide based on the work of breathing and their FAO2 and once they reach over 1.25 and they are stable with no distress we wean this off so this tends to reduce your intermittent hypoxic episodes this is because as the baby is building on the feeds reflex tends to overlap and whenever there is a slight reflex and they hold their breath with reflex laryngospasm the lung derecruits and then this keeping this background flow tends to recruit it quicker so you don't have this persisting or intermittent hypoxic episodes which can be linked to the neurodevelopment as well so it's a good practice to do that you have less septic screens because the baby is more stable and doesn't fluctuate because if they have apnea or desaturation secondary to the hypoxic episodes you may end up doing unnecessary septic screens as well so uh, this is a quick overview and uh, this is basically uh, evidence based to an extent but it's more of what we use in practice as well. So uh, I do invite comments on what you do different, any thoughts or suggestions as well is welcome. Thank you.